I was a part of a Navy SEAL team called SACOP Recon. If you know anyone who was a Navy SEAL, they'll tell you they never heard of us, which is by design. They'll think you mean Spec Ops. We're above that. Spec Ops guys don't even know we exist. The team operates within special access programs, all of which are programs and projects that have the highest security clearance the United States government uses. I can't tell you any of the things I worked on, and I wouldn't if I could. Let's just say that if the military or an intel group needed to see or do anything underwater that no one could know about, and that also required knowledge of technologies and information that even regular SEALs aren't cleared to have access to, they'd send us in. Our job was to survey the site in detail, not like you see on National Geographic where they do some sonar scans and sit back and write a paper about it and pat themselves on the back. They take years, sometimes decades, to do what we have to do in a few days. We map out every inch of the area with high-quality sonar, infrared, visible light, x-ray, backscatter microwave, and a few things I can't mention. By the time we're done, if there's a dime sitting buried in the sand on the ocean floor, you can find it in our data. Our work is quickly processed and handed over to our sister team called SACOP Strike. Normal SEAL teams call these guys fire teams. They do everything from sabotage, disarming mines, to underwater combat. Yes, combat. Actual underwater combat. They have special weapons designed to work underwater, and I'm not talking about mere knives and spear guns. Anyway, it was 2013, and we were sent to the Baltic Sea with orders to check out something that had recently been found on the ocean floor by some sunken treasure hunters. It's called the Baltic Sea Anomaly. The Swedish government had quietly shut the treasure hunter's study of the object down and made them sign national security oaths to keep their mouths shut and play it off like they can't find funding for further expedition. Meanwhile, they called the United States for assistance. They have their own divers, of course. But this thing was shutting down any and all electronics that came within 200 feet of it. They were stumped. The object itself was located about 300 feet below the surface and was just sitting there on the ocean floor. It was almost perfectly round except for a few sections that looked as if they had been cut out. It had the basic shape of that ship Han Solo flew in the Star Wars movies, the Millennium Falcon. The treasure hunter's original sonar image had been published before the Swedes had the situation under control so the public was already theorizing it to be a UFO. It was not. The object sat at the end of a long trail in the sand that stretched out on the bottom and into a ravine that appeared to be cut out of a small undersea mountain. This gave the impression to some that this was a crash landing scar on the ocean floor where the object had slid to a stop upon its sinking. It was not. I was looking forward to the challenge of performing a reconnaissance mission without the aid of electronics. We brought a few devices with us just in case, but were fully prepared and expecting not to be able to use them. We even had underwater flares in case our lights shut off. Our mission was simple. Determine the basic nature of the object and survey its exterior in detail. This sounds easier than it is, especially without cameras and electronics. To determine the nature of the object, we use the null hypothesis approach. This is where you try to rule things out by attempting to disprove your hypothesis. In this case, we were acting on the hypothesis that the formation was natural in origin. Was it sandstone or a buildup of sediment that just happened to form a shape that coincidentally looked like a construction? Deep down, and I was thinking it was probably some Y equipment that had been scuttled or blasted off of a ship during the war. Maybe the base of a large ship-mounted gun. But why would it be knocking electronics out? And how? At any rate, all of us were geologists, marine biologists, and oceanographers, so we knew exactly what to look for. I know that might sound odd to you. 
You have to understand that knowing what we are doing in all situations that we might encounter is what the military was paying for. You are not deployed in our group without these skills. If you don't want to do the schooling, stay in the regular SEALs. In addition to our skills, that our team only had two squads of three men, each and no commanding officers. All six of us were officers of equal rank. We designed the missions ourselves and operated with extreme self-discipline. If you need an officer to tell you what to do, then you aren't fit for our kind of work. The Navy learned the hard way a long time ago that a commanding officer's ego can ruin a mission in certain circumstances. And while it might be necessary to have one when the men under him need that to perform, in the case of SECOP missions, they only get in the way and risk lives and mission failure, and we did not fail at our missions. It wasn't allowed. Teams in the old days had to keep shanking their commanding officers to ensure mission success, and finally the Navy just started letting us do our thing. My squad was going to start by taking samples of the surface material that had settled or otherwise built up on the object. We would drill through it with diamond-tipped hand-powered drills we had to determine what the object beneath was composed of. We'd do this with the aid of special chemistry test kits we had which were designed to work in ocean water. Remember, we couldn't use spectrometers because electronics were useless. The other team was going to examine every inch of the thing looking for signs of manufacturing. Both teams would also create a map of the object's magnetic field and variance. If there was any, using only handheld compasses and underwater pencil. Yes, we were that good. We began our dive when the sun was exactly 45 degrees above the horizon. This would provide enough light so we wouldn't need to use our flares for most of the day. We didn't bring air tanks except small ones for emergencies and instead had hoses coming from the surface supported by airbags every 50 feet. This would allow us to stay down as long as we needed. The strike team was topside in the boat making sure the air pumps were working and preparing for whatever they might have to do once we came back with our assessment. They weren't expecting to have to do anything as we all assumed that this was either a piece of wartime hardware or an ancient ruin, but they were prepared anyway. They always were. On the way down, I noticed there were no fish or life of any kind in the waters around us. Usually that time of year you could find flounder, herring, cod, and other species of fish swimming about. Maybe it was an odd coincidence, but I found it noteworthy just the same. As we approached the object, a strange feeling came over us. It was an unusual feeling for us all. It was mild fear and apprehension. We had all been in much more dangerous situations than this before, and we were trained not to fear. We didn't fear death, injury, or even drowning, yet all of us reported this same sensation. We wore special dive masks that covered our entire faces so we could speak to each other. Sam travels well in the water, and so as long as we were close enough, we could all discuss what we needed to. We agreed to continue the mission in spite of this feeling, but to make sure we kept each other aware of any increase in feelings of duress that we might experience. We soon arrived at the object and split up into our respective squads. Up close, the object was clearly not a natural formation, but we would go through our process anyway to be thorough. The object was somewhat flat on top, except for a small, perfectly smooth dome on the right side. To the left side, there was a stairway going up to the flat top. The right angles and straight lines on the object had been dismissed as a rare but real natural phenomena that occurs due to the molecular nature of certain types of stone combined with water erosion from tides and currents. But here the stairs were sandwiched between flat stone walls on both sides, which would prevent water from moving in the necessary directions, to erode the stairs into the perfect steps that they were. I chipped off a small chunk of the material on the side of the structure and put it into my test kit's receptacle, squeezed some chemicals into the enclosure, and shook it. I already knew, but the resulting color of the mixture verified that the object was indeed covered with a thick layer of silt and sand that had built up, compacted, and hardened over time. 
It must have taken a long time to get into the state. It was in because that part of the Baltic Sea didn't have a lot of turbulent water or natural silt. I got the drill out and turned the hand crank as the bit sunk into the caked on silt and sand. It went down about four inches when it hit the underlying structure. I withdrew the drill, blew the silt out of the hole with a turkey baster type of device we use, and looked in. I recognized the material right away. It was coarse grained granite, pink, black, and white specks together. The surface of the object wasn't just made from granite which shouldn't be found at the bottom of the sea but it was polished granite, perfectly flat and smooth. I cleared off some more of the compacted sand covering the area and showed it to my team. Brent and David, both of whom were busy mapping the magnetic variance of the object. David swam over to the other squad to inform them of the discovery while Brent showed me the map they had made thus far. It was unbelievable. They drew on a plastic sheet that had a sketch of the object on it with a special kind of grease pencil that worked underwater. The lines they drew around it represented the distance from the object where the magnetic field the object emitted varied from standard north or south, and each line had a number on it indicating how many degrees off from the expected compass reading it was at that point. According to the map, the object was pulling the compass needle a full 45 degrees away from magnetic north towards itself. This effect was not present at the surface as we had checked before descending. Just then David swam back over and told us that the other squad had found something that we needed to see. We met them behind the object where the bottom of the structure met the ocean floor. The men had discovered a small doorway. My squad volunteered to go inside. We removed our airlines and hooked up our emergency air tanks, each containing about a half hour of air. It was dark inside the passageway, and so I lit up a flare. We were in a hallway that led back towards the front of the object, but underneath it, the walls had less silt on them, and we could wipe it off with our hands down to the polished granite. About halfway back, the passageway ramped upward, and we walked up and out of the water into a large room inside the structure. The room was dark and cold. My flare lit the walls and ceiling, revealing the same polished granite as the outside. There were engravings in the stone wall every four feet or so. The ceiling was about twelve feet from the floor. The room was a half circle in shape and had three granite tables that resembled altars a little bit, one on each side of the ramp and one behind it. The rest of the room was bare. I tried to turn on my flashlight and, as expected, it did not work. David started sketching the images on the engravings which appeared to me to be depictions of human sacrifice. In the images, the rituals were taking place on the top exterior of the very structure we were inside. It was clear from the scenes depicted that this building wasn't always underwater. Either the oceans had risen since it was in use, or the land had sunken. Brent pulled me over to one of these engravings and pointed. There in the image was some creature devouring the sacrifice. The men in the scene weren't sacrificing people to some deity. They were feeding a monster. It was like a man in that it had two legs and feet. However, at the waist, it appeared to have about a dozen tentacles coming off its body, but no arms. It did have a head, though, but it looked more like a giant mouth gaping open with a large teeth. The thing had large feathers coming off its back and the top of its head as well. I've never seen anything like it depicted before. However, there are some Aztec and pre-Columbian figures that are similar in a few ways. Brent and I quickly measured the room's dimensions and did a walkthrough covering every square foot of the place. We found a stone door that appeared as though it was supposed to rotate on a central shaft. However, we could not get it to budge. We discovered a stairwell that descended downward, but not back into the water. This went down into stone. We surmised that the structure had been built on top of an even larger rock or mountain that was now buried by the seafloor. We descended the stone stairwell, which was not made of the same granite as the upper chamber. Instead, this material looked like standard seafloor basalt. The stairs ended about 40 feet down into a small antechamber. There were some relics on the floor there, a spear and a set of ankle shackles. Both appeared completely oxidized to the point where they would probably disintegrate upon our attempting to pick them up. 
The room had an opening that led into a huge cavern, which was lit by an abundance of bioluminescent algae, which coated much of the cave walls, as well as a small river that flowed in and out of a set of pools. The water glowed a bright aqua color from this algae, which made the water cloudy and opaque. There were large quartz crystals embedded in the rock, along with iron pyrite and veins of gold. The view was spectacular. We wondered aloud what had been in those shackles. We suspected it was the creature from the engravings or perhaps a sacrificial victim. There were footpaths that ran between the rock and stalagmites that formed the floor of the cavern. We split up and each proceeded down different paths, giving ourselves exactly ten minutes' time to meet back at the foot of the stairwell. Our air would be running out by then, and we weren't going to risk trying to breathe the ancient air down there. We'd have to head back soon. We took air, water, and sand samples, as well as photographs using old-fashioned non-electronic cameras loaded with a special film designed for low light. The cavern seemed to go back at least 300 feet, with a ceiling around 30 feet high, the width I estimated in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 feet. I could hear water pouring into water coming from the rear of the cave, and so I headed back to ascertain whether or not there was some kind of waterfall back there someplace. I rounded a bend in the footpath and saw the source of the sound. A two-foot diameter flow of water was pouring out of the sidewall of the cave about 20 feet up, arcing into a pool that was recessed in the floor. Behind the waterfall, there were several skeletons chained up to the back wall. I started to take some photos of this when I felt something wrap around my right ankle. Looking down, I beheld a black tentacle protruding up out of the pool, which had wrapped around my lower leg several turns. I instinctively pulled my leg away, but it tightened its grip as I did so. I sounded a distress call from a noise-making device. We each carried on our wetsuit as I struck the tentacle with my fist in the hope it might release me. It pulled back a bit, which caused me to fall onto my back. I reached for my rock pick as the thing rose up out of the water. It was hideous. It used its tentacles for support on the black, rocky ground. Its head was like an octopus, only the mouth was front-facing. It growled, baring what reminded me of shark teeth, with several rolls going towards the back of its throat. It started to pull me towards it and lift me up off the ground when Brent reached me, with David not far behind. He struck the tentacle that held me with his rock pick, letting loose a glowing, aqua-colored fluid from the creature's flesh. It immediately dropped me and turned its attention to Brent. Its saucer-sized, amber eyes twitched back and forth as it examined him a moment before it lashed out with two of its tentacles. As it did, both of these appendages projected long, thin, sharp, white-ribbed rods from their tips which pierced Brent's torso. The creature then lifted him up and pulled him in towards its gaping and shrieking mouth. David had arrived at my location by then and began to drag my body backwards away from the thing as it put Brent's head into its mouth and closed it in a circular fashion around his neck where its teeth cut through Brent's wetsuit and flesh. He flayed around, trying to break free for a moment before the creature had bitten his head clean off. We could only watch and take a few photos from a distance as it used its tentacles to peel back his wetsuit and munch on Brent's body like a human would when dashing a shrimp. I got to my feet as David announced that we needed to let the strike team handle it. The two of us headed for the stairwell as fast as we could. Before we could get there, the creature swam along the river next to us and jumped out of the water tackling David while thrusting its pointy rods through him, just like it did to Brent. David and the beast fell over sideways, and it proceeded to feed on him. It did so with such ferocity and speed that I had no time to try to save him. All I could do was run and take advantage of the fact that it would be stalled from killing me for a minute as it feasted on David. I glanced back as I ran and saw that the creature had put David's lifeless body down and had begun to pursue me. I guess it didn't want to lose any of that rare human meal it had discovered. I suppose it had been feeding on the algae in the water for so long that the taste of blood once again after all these years was too much for it to resist. 
Just as I was reaching the opening into the small chamber where the stairwell was, the thing flung itself at me, and I landed on my back. I had my rock pick in hand by then, so I started to bang its pointed tip into the meat of one of the monster's tentacles. It withdrew it, but as it did, the thing wrapped its body around my upper torso and pressed its flesh against the back of my neck, where I could feel tiny bristle, like hairs stick into my spine. Like little needles, they inserted deep into my nervous system, where the creature hijacked my motor control. It used this method to couple with my brain, and our minds became one mind. I knew its entire history, thoughts, and experiences. I understood its deepest motivations and desires, and it knew mine. It used my legs to walk as it rode me like a horse back up the stairwell, into the chamber above, and down the ramp to the open sea outside. It hadn't been out of the cavern in over a millennia as it needed a human host to climb the stairs. I could feel its excitement as we exited the structure and proceeded to kill the three men in the other squad who had been waiting for our return. Knowing the lethality of the strike team, it opted to steal an inflatable motorized raft and sink the boat by having me chip a hole in the hull with my rock pick. The sound of my doing this alerted the seals inside to our presence and two of them entered the water to check it out as we sped off in the raft. I got an oversized trench coat to hide the creature on my back so I could move about among the masses without causing a stir. I haven't checked in with the Navy in several weeks now and am currently sitting in a cheap hotel room in Barcelona typing this. While I would like to be rid of this thing, I also have to admit that I feel its pleasure at the taste of human blood and meat. Our minds have become one, and, and I'm as much it as I am me. I know the military will have sent a wet team to track me down by now, and I know they will probably eventually find me. I have to stay on the move. The trail of dead will soon give away my whereabouts, as the method of the kills is unique and leaves its own signature. I'm putting this story online as a last-ditch effort to get a message through to my dear mother, Jane, the only person I still feel connected to and whom I miss dearly. I love you, Mom. I'm sorry about all of this, and maybe someday, if I'm lucky, we can meet again. I've already left too many bodies here, so I'm leaving Barcelona tonight before daybreak. But first, I feed again. It was October 8th of 2010, and we're going bear hunting up by Golden Lake. It was just another day. We'd hunted most of the day, unproductive. We found one small buck, and we said it's a young deer. Let's let this one grow up, so we passed on that deer. Then we ended up going into another area, and we're coming around the corner. It's probably 5 o'clock. We came around this corner. Well, it's not really a corner, it's kind of like an open field, but it's a blind corner because you can't see past these trees. So it opens up into a field. We both look and see this thing at the same exact time. The truck stops. I pointed my rifle at it, and I could see it through the scope. I had my scope on 16 power. I could see it pretty clearly. Everybody asked me, well, what was going through your head. Did you think it was a bear? I thought a lot of things. It wasn't that I was a skeptic. It was that I didn't know that anybody believed in Bigfoot at all. We saw this creature. It was walking on two legs, hairy. The best way I can describe it is it looked like a person in a suit. Probably three or four seconds had gone by and it started to walk towards us. Between 180 yards, somewhere in there, it had its arms in the air and was waving them, almost like don't shoot. Don't shoot. Kind of a universal thing in any language. Anybody raises his hands. Sign of surrender. I didn't know what it was. To me, it was just a monster. I didn't know what it was. I'm looking at this monster. By this time, I have the bullet in the chamber, my finger on the trigger, and it's coming towards us slowly. It's taking steps, waving. A lot of people are saying I shot it in the back, so if you have a deer and you shoot it behind the shoulder, then you're going to penetrate both lungs. On a person, it's a hard area to describe, but it's basically right under the shoulder where the lungs are located. 
so maybe five seconds had passed, and my buddy, he says, don't shoot, don't shoot, it's not a bear, do not shoot, and I'm still kind of locked in on this thing. To me, it was a monster, that's all it was. You know, the gun's getting ready to go off. We've hunted together a lot over the years, and we both knew what was going to happen. Normally, when we see something, the truck stops. Both of us get out, and we've got our rifles on it immediately. Well, my buddy was still using his binoculars because he didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to think. I'm looking at this thing, and I'm pretty close to pulling the trigger. I've just been squeezing this whole time. And he's getting louder and louder. He's like, hey, bro, shoot. Don't shoot. There's not a bear. That's a person in a suit. That's a person in a suit. Don't shoot. And I'm thinking, well, if that's a person in a suit, then we've got a real problem here. Because they're walking around during bear season with a fur suit on. Something don't add up about this. I'm halfway thinking in the back of my mind that somebody's going to pull around the corner and it's going to be like a film crew or something. I don't know. My mind's going a hundred miles an hour. But I see this animal, this furry thing, and we're here to hunt. We're here to kill animals, and it was just a monster. So I pull the trigger and you could see dust shoot off the side of it like it obviously made a really good hit. Definitely got it in the lungs. And it took off running. Just then we see two, I guess you'd call them kids or cubs or something, I don't know. The big one's almost out of sight, and these two come right out, and my buddy's like, holy S, really? There's more of them. So we drive the truck into the field as far as we can, maybe 30 yards. Then we take off running. We heard the thing crash, though. It crashed. It sounded like a car wreck. We knew we made a good hit. It's very normal to shoot a deer and have it run 50, 60, 70 yards and expire. So we run up there and my buddy doesn't even grab his gun. I mean, we're just running, trying to run over to this thing and cubs are just out of sight. And we run over there and now we're face to face with these kids. Probably 10 yards away or so and we can't find the big one. So I decide I'm going to shoot one of the kids and my buddy's like, no, do not shoot. Do not shoot. Okay, okay, all right. We'll find the big one. We'll get it, and we'll leave. So we end up looking for 15 minutes or so. Meanwhile, the kids, they're looking for the parent, obviously. They're walking around looking for their parent. We knew we were looking in the right area then. I've made the mistake of shooting a sow, and then the piglets come running out, and they always know right where their mom is. They take it to the body. So we knew that it was right there. We just couldn't find it. It's an extremely brushy area. I mean, we could have looked for two weeks and not found it. So there's blood on the ground. We're kind of looking at the blood. We're walking around. We split up probably 10 or 15 times. He'd go one way, I'd go the other way. And the kids would do the same thing. They'd walk into the center of the open field and they'd say something to each other. It sounded like deaf chatter. They'd go, wah, wah, whoa. They'd say something to each other. Then they'd split up. Then about a minute later, they'd come back, almost like you see anything. You see anything? No. Okay. Did you look by that tree? Did you look by the stump? Yeah, I looked by the stump. Did you look by the tree? I'll look by the other tree. They didn't care that we were there. They were not alarmed at all. They were just there. And so, maybe 15 minutes goes by or so, and I keep deciding that I'm going to shoot one of the little ones. It's like we'll shoot one of these, throw it in the back, and we'll figure it out. And my buddy's like, no, no, that's terrible. Don't do that. There's no reason for that. There's absolutely no reason to do this. So at the time, everything's running through my head. I'm thinking if we don't get one of the little ones, nobody's ever going to believe us. It's just going to be a crazy story. We just need to find the big one, and we need to get out of here. So eventually, me and my buddy are split up, and I'm down this hill, and it's almost like straight uphill, maybe 15 yards away, maybe 20, and one of them, the little one, is starting to approach me. It's getting closer. It's getting closer, starting to make some noise like the deaf chatter thing. It's getting closer, and I was thinking, 
I don't know what's going to happen here, but he's going to get too close. It's way too close for comfort. Screw it, I'm going to shoot. So I shoot it directly in the neck, because I didn't want to mess up the skull or the face. And it rolled down the hill, and actually, it hit my feet. Starts bleeding on my boots. Still alive. So I pick it up, and I'm sitting there looking at it, and I'm starting to feel back. I'm starting to realize, what have I done? What have I done? Dad went on for a couple minutes. There was a lot of stuff that happened in there, but to summarize it, make a long story short, it died. And then my buddy walks up, and he's like, what have you done? Seriously, really. And I'm like, fine, forget this. So I throw it on the ground, and I start walking off, walking back to the truck. Then I look back, and my buddy's holding it, just holding it, sitting there, staring at it. So, I walk back to him like, dude, we gotta get out of here. Somebody just heard a shot. You know that somebody's going to show up fishing game. We're going to get in so much trouble. We're going to go to jail. We need to get out of here. This is crazy. Let's go. He says, okay. Okay, let's hide this. We'll come back for it later. We'll come back. So we take it into the bush. Get it as deep as we can. Throw a bunch of stuff on top of it. And then we leave. Not saying a word. We actually drove out of there probably 60 miles an hour on that dirt road. It doesn't make sense, but we were just afraid we were going to get caught, get in trouble, something. So we drove down to Sierraville and we stopped there. Both of us quit smoking in like the last six months. Gross habit. But we both walk in, get a pack of cigarettes without saying a word. And we drive all the way home without saying a word. Smoke the whole thing. Then he dropped me off. A couple of days later, I get on taxidermy. Yep, I've got a few friends on there, and I'm trying to think if there's some way I can talk about what happened. So I make a post, like, So if you saw Bigfoot, would you shoot it? That's all I said, and everybody's going back and forth. Taxidermists are outdoor people. They've got a fascination with wildlife. They've hunted all their life. There's a bunch of guys one there who were like, Oh, no, I seen one. I seen one. I know they're real. And it turned into this really long topic, so maybe 20 pages goes by, and I get on there, and I just say, I'll tell you what. You can call it X if you want. I don't care. But I shot something that walked on two legs. I was hunting solo on our land when I stumbled across multiple dead deer heads thrown into a creek. I was already jittery hunting as a solo female, knowing we'd been dealing with poachers on the land. While investigating and taking pictures of the dump to call into our game warden, I heard a truck idle for a few seconds, then suddenly peel out of there once I was spotted. I immediately called up the warden instead of waiting until I got home to report my findings. Ohio had been getting hit hard with CWD, and I did know that is was spreading my way. I just remember the first adrenaline spike of stumbling upon the pile, and then again when a, the sound of a truck peeled out. My heart hit my toes, and all I could think was that we both most likely had guns. They knew where I was but I didn't know where they were. When I was out hunting with a friend in western Wisconsin, I didn't expect the day to take such a chilling turn. We had set out early in the morning, full of anticipation, ready to track down a few deer. The woods were serene, the air crisp, and the autumn colors of the leaves created a mesmerizing tapestry above our heads. After hours of waiting in our stand, the sun began its slow descent towards the horizon. As we watched and hoped for any sign of deer, the daylight gradually waned. We knew that our hunt was coming to an end, and we'd have to start our trek back to the cabin. The walk to our stand had been long, a mile and a half of uneven terrain and dense woods. It was tiring, especially after a day of hunting, but our excitement had kept us going. However, on our return, with darkness settling in, 
The forest seemed to transform into a realm of secrets, one we were intruding upon. We walked in silence, the only sounds the crunch of leaves beneath our boots and the occasional hoot of an owl. But then, as if from the depths of a nightmare, we heard it, a blood-curdling scream that sent shivers down my spine. It sounded like a woman in agony, her voice twisted in terror and pain. My friend and I halted in our tracks, our flashlight scanning the darkness for the source of that wretched scream. Our hearts pounded in our chests, and we exchanged anxious glances. That scream was far from ordinary. It sent a chilling wave of dread coursing through our veins. We strained our ears, hoping to hear something that would explain the horrifying sound. But there was nothing. No rustling leaves, no footsteps, no voices, just an eerie silence that felt almost as disturbing as the scream itself. We whispered to each other, questioning what we had just heard, whether it was some sort of prank or a wild animal imitating a human cry. But we both knew, deep down, that what we'd heard was beyond ordinary. With our flashlights trembling, we cautiously moved forward, inching our way back to the cabin. The forest that had felt like a sanctuary earlier in the day now seemed like a realm of dread, hiding its secrets in the shadows. Every snap of a twig or gust of wind sent us into high alert, as we couldn't shake the image of that chilling scream. We finally made it back to the cabin, locking the door behind us and sitting in bewildered silence. We couldn't find an explanation for what we had heard. That scream haunted our thoughts, raising questions without answers. We never did figure out what had happened that evening in the woods of western Wisconsin. The memory of that scream still lingers in the corners of my mind, a reminder of the mysteries that can be hidden deep within the wilderness. Staying at my granddad's farm in Cornwall, United Kingdom, picture big fields, long, narrow lanes of thick trees and bushes, all right next to massive Clifford by the sea. Just finished watching the Hand of the Baskervilles' The Sherlock episode about a massive black dog that kills people. So I finish watching it about 11 p.m. in my granddad's farmhouse. Then I have to walk about one kilometer to the cottage I'm actually sleeping in. As I'm walking down the long lane with my flashlight, start thinking if there's any place where an animal like that could exist. It's probably somewhere like here where it's so remote. Look up and see it's a full moon then. As I look back down, I see two red dots in the distance rushing towards me. Two eyes. Can tell it's some animal and the eyes are like a meter off the ground, so I know it's no small farm cat or something. Lost my shit and just froze. So it got to me and turns out that a family friend was visiting who has a massive boar bowl, very large dog. Dog was a gentle giant, thankfully, because I was frozen to the spot. In an undetermined year, my stepdad resided in Virginia when he was approximately eight years old, right on the edge of the great dismal swamp. According to his account, one night, when the sky was either cloudless or exceptionally bright, he hadn't considered the moon's presence until recently, he encountered a peculiar sight. Looking out of his window, he saw a creature that was staring directly at him. He described it as having spittle running down its face, with eyes locked onto his. This creature was purportedly standing on its hind legs, covered in matted fur of cream, red, and brown hues, its facial features were notably human-like, except for its snout. It had high jawbones, a structure around its eyes and eyes themselves that bore a striking resemblance to a human. He believed the creature's eye color to be yellow. What makes this account intriguing and potentially credible is the vast expanse of the great dismal swamp, a region that has remained largely untouched by humans. In recent years, researchers have begun studying the swamp's inhabitants. The swamp's environment is characterized by wet, mossy grounds that effectively absorb sound. People have been known to wander into it and vanish without a trace. 
The mystery of what might be concealed in this uncharted territory sends a chill down my spine. Oh, I almost forgot to mention that that night he crawled out of his bed and sought refuge in his mother's room. In the morning, when they inspected the house, they discovered that the ground under all the windows had been disturbed, and the grass showed signs of being trampled. There were even visible scratches on the wood beneath his window, and paint was missing. Strangely, there were no discernible footprints to explain these unusual occurrences. I was lying across my bed, wide awake, when I heard a low, deep growl from just outside my window. I hauled out to my mom, Jen, who was in the living room. She informed me via VoIP app that she had heard the growl as well. While we were talking, I heard a second growl from outside my room, and it was loud enough for me to hear it even in the living room where my mom was speaking. We decided to move to the same room, the living room, for the rest of the night to ensure our safety. I took a trip up to my sister's place on Roan Mountain in 1989 with my wife. After the first few days of running around and seeing the sights, we spent the day just hanging out at the house. This led to a few cold beverages being consumed and the grill getting fired up that evening. Later that night, around 9 p.m., I went out on the back porch to get another beer. That's when I noticed about half a dozen deer about 100 yards out in the field behind the house. One had a nice rack, and I couldn't quite make out the number of points. So I slipped off the porch and eased over to the corner of the fence, which put me about 60 to 70 yards away from them. As I stood there against the fence watching the deer, that's when I noticed the moon. When I say I noticed it, I mean, I noticed that it was huge and seemed much closer than I'd ever seen it before. I stood there at this fence, watching the deer, or was supposed to be, but I couldn't take my eyes off this big, glowing, yellowish-orange ball of light that seemed to be just out of reach. So after what I thought was about twenty minutes later, I found out it was more than an hour, I started noticing a tickling sensation on the back of my neck. I shrugged my shoulders and turned my neck a couple of times to shake loose whatever was tickling me, and just then the deer got spooked and bounced away. The noise finally forced me to break my gaze on the moon. That's when I realized that I'd probably been out there long enough. I decided to go back inside. I took one last look and mumbled a wow at the beauty of this little sun, reflecting satellite that orbits our world, and that's when it hit me. I felt the hot breath of a huge creature hit the back of my neck at the same time hearing or feeling the deepest chest rumbling I'd ever heard. I spied on to my right, looking over my shoulder. All I could see was black as far as my peripheral vision would allow. It was a Bigfoot. This all happened in a split second. When I got my head around far enough, I realized that my face was maybe eight to ten inches away from this thing's upper abdomen. Looking up, I saw this beast's pectoral muscles stick off its chest about six inches, and they were huge. Its chest was every bit four and a half feet wide. Its shoulders were as big as basketballs, adding another foot or so on each side from shoulder to shoulder. This thing was at least six feet wide. I didn't get a good look at its hands or face, but its arms were probably more impressive than its chest and shoulders. Its arms were covered in long, dark hair, maybe four or six inches in length. If I had to guess, this behemoth must have been around ten feet tall and seven to eight hundred pounds. As far as its face went from the angle I was at, all I could make out was a squared, off-bearded chin. I couldn't see a nose, eyes, ears, a raised brow ridge, a conical head, nothing. So I couldn't say whether it looked more like a man or an ape. Its arms were more like an ape's, but its chest was more human, like just a little hairier than most. Now this is where the story starts getting weird. As I mentioned earlier, it all happened in a split second. As I spun around and was in the process of looking up, the creature was going from a bent over position to standing up straight and taking a step back to my right. 
as it pulled its left leg over its right. It was like it was slipping through a slit in a green screen. I'm not sure if it was a portal or some sort of interdimensional doorway. All I knew is this huge thing vanished within that split second. There was no foul smell associated with this creature. There was a slight musty smell, but it reminded me of the same smell a horse gives off. This is not my personal story. It happened to my husband's friend, though I got a good chill up my spine the first time that I heard it. I haven't met the couple, but my husband is Mr. Pragmatic, and he wouldn't tell the story if it wasn't true. When my husband's friend and his wife decided that they wanted a family, they moved to a house in the middle of nowhere. We're talking the total boondocks. The closest neighbors were over a mile down the road. Forests surrounded them, and to these folks this was a dream come true. They moved in, nested, and soon their first child was born. There was one nerve-wracking part of their lives, though. The husband occasionally worked a night shift. I want to say that he was a cop, but I may be getting that part wrong. While the wife enjoyed living in the country, the nights alone were a little intimidating. Her anxiety was enhanced by the birth of their kid. She didn't feel that she could adequately defend the baby by herself. The husband tried to ease her mind and bought a gun to keep in a safe in the bedroom. She learned how to use it, which brought her some sense of comfort. One night when her husband was working, the wife heard a loud rattling sound. Afraid, she grabbed the gun from the safe. She quietly made her way through a hallway and was able to see her son sleeping safely in his bed as the rattling continued at what she then discerned as the back door. As she neared the back door, she saw a man wrestling with a lock on the door under the glow of an outside security light. Here's where the story became especially creepy, at least in my opinion. Though she was cloaked in relative darkness, there must have been enough light shining through the glass door for the man to notice her. He suddenly stopped what he was doing and held eye contact with her. They stood there staring at each other. Then, without breaking eye contact, the man's face transformed into a snarl and he started trying to break the glass on the door. The wife raised the gun and shot. Glass flew everywhere. The man fell and went into death grips. She was there alone with his body until the sheriff's department arrived. When the husband got to the house, the crime scene was still intact. He said that he had never wanted to kick something so much as that intruder's corpse. I traveled about an hour from my home in Lynchburg, Virginia, to do some exploring in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm not big on hiking or whatever, but I had recently gone through a breakup with my boyfriend. I just needed some fresh air and some time alone. I parked and just started wandering. I didn't follow a specific path. I was mesmerized by the gigantic trees, the fauna, and the wildlife. I was really enjoying myself. I'd been hiking for about two hours when I saw this large hole on a nearby mountainside. It wasn't too far, seemed like it was a manageable climb. So I climbed up, and when I got to the grotto, I stuck my head in, and it was dark. I turned on my phone's flashlight, and that's when I realized this was a deep cave. I got a little carried away, thinking about how I had discovered a cave, wondering if anybody else had ever been up here. It was sort of exciting. I ducked down, and I walked in. I went in a few feet I was very careful, but I could see a smooth rock floor beneath me. I felt safe, so I continued walking forward, following the light from my flashlight. I was maybe 15 or 20 feet in when I realized I was in a cavern. There were a few openings in the walls surrounding the cavern. I picked the closest one to me and I looked in. It was another tunnel. It was big enough to walk through, so I stepped through the opening and I carefully walked a few more feet. That's when I heard scampering. I stopped walking, thinking maybe I had kicked something. I looked all around but saw nothing. I then heard the scampering again. And when I raised my phone up to look ahead of me, I saw a person, only like not a regular person, but a humanoid. It was fully nude, and it looked very malnourished. It was crouched down on its hands and feet about four feet in front of me. 
It was so pale, like maybe it had never, ever even seen the sun. Its face was sunken in, and I could clearly see the cheekbones. It had totally black eyes. Not just the pupils, but all black. Between its hands was a half-eaten rabbit. I heard the chattering sound, and I realized that this humanoid was making the noise. I don't know how I knew, but it was calling out to others. I moved back toward the entrance, but I kept my flashlight on it. It seemed fearful of the light and didn't try to move towards me. I was able to get back through the entrance, and I took a look around. I didn't see anything else. I then ran for my life back the way I came, and I could hear the chattering, and it was getting closer and louder. There had to be more than just one. I felt like I was being hunted. I was able to see the light from the original opening. I tripped I quickly got up and rushed out of that hole. I ran and slid down the mountain. I only stopped when I was sure nothing had followed me. Then I realized I had no phone. I must have lost it when I tripped. I had no idea where I was, but I was just happy to be alive. I did eventually find the trail and I managed to make it back to my car. I found the local police station, but it was pointless because they wouldn't take me seriously. So I just drove home. I cried so much on that drive, and when I got home, I checked my phone's location with the satellite feature. All I could see was a heavily wooded area. The last time I checked the location of my phone, it had moved several miles away from its original location. I'm sure the battery has long since run out. I have done a bit of research online and found references to crawler humanoids, but I'm just wondering if this was a feral human of some kind. Regardless, I'm not going back to that area. A buddy and I went hunting when we were young, 12, 13. We had bub guns and pocket knives and thought we were cool. As we chilled quietly, trying not to scare anything away, probably 40 yards behind my friend in the direction that led to the thick of the woods, I saw a very tall, completely covered in fur, an upright figure running freakishly fast, away from us, into the woods. I screamed and ran as fast as I could home, which was about a mile at the time. I still don't know what it was, and thinking about it gives me chills. My experiences took place in the early 80s in Toronto, Canada, and just like the fellow writing of his experiences on your site, mine also took place in a very old house. The house then was at least 75 years old and has since been razed to the ground and a brand new structure was built in its place. When my family moved in there, we experienced the same sort of events, arguments, abusive situations, and strange phenomena but not to the point where we all noticed it right away. In fact, my younger brother was a skeptic up to the point where things began happening to him as well. I think he took this attitude to allay the fears he must have had. Our father moved out of the house after the first year and away to another part of the country, so just the three of us were left. At one point, we had family come and live with us before they too departed. My experiences began with an event I will never forget when I was 16. It was summer and I had difficulty sleeping. This went on for one month approximately. Then one night I had fallen into a light sleep when I was violently awakened. I recall hearing a sound that I thought was an explosion and thinking that our stove must have exploded in the kitchen below me. I opened my eyes and looked around the room in the darkness, but saw nothing to indicate anything was happening. Suddenly, my bed began to shake violently up and down, and it felt as though I was being electrocuted through my solar plexus. I couldn't move, but I could see my feet moving as the bed was jumping up and down. Some objects rolled up off my dresser and shot towards the bed. I thought they would hit me as they approached with such speed. In fact, they stopped suddenly and began to swirl around in a counterclockwise direction above me. And from the center of this swirl, a bright white light appeared, and some voices which were like high-pitched shrieks, or nails on a blackboard, said quite clearly, The message we bring is to tell the people he is still alive. And then everything stopped suddenly. I was terrified and basically thought I would end up in a nut house. 
I remember shaking from fear so much I could barely get out of bed. I made my way to my mom's room to tell her about it, at which point she assured me I was having nightmares. Say your prayers and go back to sleep, she said. I returned to my room after an hour or more, but I couldn't sleep. It was a long time before I could sleep there. In fact, the next event happened the following January. I was coming home very late one night and decided to take the shortcut through the alleyway by our street. I passed a parked van with windows all around and I saw a movement in the van which made me feel somehow by its shape, size, and response that it was a Doberman someone had left outside in their van. I kept walking, but the thought pestered me that someone should leave their dog out in midwinter in the night. So I went back to the van cautiously peering in, but there was nothing at all, not even a cushion or anything hanging from the ceiling. Okay, I thought I guess I imagined it. I happily kept walking home, and when I was in the alley, I suddenly heard footsteps behind me in the snow. I got a little freaked out, and when I turned my head, I didn't see anyone there. As I got to the end of the alleyway and turned onto my street, I looked back to the entrance to see if anyone was following me. What I saw shocked and terrified me. There was a street light right at the corner, and in the pool of its light was standing this enormous creature. It was at least eight feet tall and huge. What struck me was that its form was completely black. There were no reflective surfaces on it whatsoever. In fact, the light was shining directly on it, and it seemed to absorb that light. It had large things on its head, which I took to be horns or ears, and its fingers ended in points like claws and the feet as well. Its eyes were red, completely and staring right at me. I don't think my feet touched the ground. I ran so fast. After that experience, I had a few others with the same creature. Another night I came home late again, and I fell onto my bed after shutting the door, just wanting to fall asleep. My cat was in the bed with me when we both heard a voice laughing in the room, a masculine voice. My cat freaked out and ran to the door, scratching and meowing loudly to get out. I opened the door, and she took off. I just didn't want to believe anything was in there with me, so I pointedly turned my back to the rest of the room and went to sleep. Another night I turned over and opened my eyes early in the morning, and there was the same creature, smaller though, standing in front of my closet staring at me. I recall I got really mad and told it to F off and turned around and went back to sleep. Meanwhile, my brother had seen the exact same creature, but he had yellow eyes. He confided the story to me years later when we had left the house and had no knowledge of my experiences. He told me he had awakened early one morning and found that he had left the light on in his room. Thinking that he should get up and turn it off, he turned onto his back and opened his eyes, and there sitting on his bed's headboard was the same creature. Talons on feet and hands, completely black with no reflective surfaces. But his was, he said, about four feet tall and squatting on the headboard, staring at him with yellow eyes. He said he was terrified and decided not to turn off the light after all. I don't remember if he said it vanished quickly or if he shut his eyes and when he opened them it was gone. He said he never saw it again but had other strange experiences in that house. One day we decided that we should trade rooms. So I moved all my stuff out to his room and vice versa. I teased him and said he'd have to share my room with a visitor, but he was disbelieving. After I had moved to his room, I had my last experience in that house that was in the shadow people realm. I woke up one night to a sound in my room, like rustling. I was wide awake because I thought it might be a mouse. I switched on my lamp and looked toward the other end of the room, but seeing and hearing nothing, I lay down again with the light still on. I turned to look at the clock and saw that it was 2.20 a.m., then I saw these two large globes of light beyond my nightstand. I was frozen up on one elbow because I had been about to turn out my light again. They moved in a way that reminded me of balloons falling. The larger of the two was golden yellow in color and the smaller was blue. 
They looked like spheres lit from within and emanating a misty light from their forms. I somehow could sense that they were intelligent. They knew that I was looking at them and they wanted me to see. The larger golden one floated almost majestically to the door, whereupon it flattened to a pancake shape in under half a second and slipped under the door. The second smaller one followed along and did the same. I was very nervous and scared at that point, but only because I had to go to the bathroom, and this meant I had to go out into the hallway where they had vanished to. Our hallway was very dark and without a proper light, as the house was old and not renovated very well. I waited for as long as I could, which was about fifteen minutes, and then I cautiously opened my door and went. The hallway was pitch black, so my plan was to inch my way to the bathroom with my back to the wall, so nothing could sneak up on me, and once I got there, I could turn on the bathroom light to illuminate the hallway. I followed my plan through, and as it turned out, when I turned on the bathroom light, it shone down on under the stairs in the first landing. In the light were two shadow people. I've only ever thought of them that way because there was no other way to describe them. They looked like shadows, only they were in the light. They didn't look like the other creatures I had seen. In fact, they looked like people in the sense that they had a head and arms and legs and torso and hands. They threw up their hands as though in surprise, like I'd caught them unexpectedly, and then they flew down the stairs without a sound. It took me a long time to come out of that bathroom as I didn't want to encounter any of these things again. Unlike your other poster, these creatures never touched me, at least to my knowledge, and never tried to hurt me, although they did scare the dickens out of me. I recall telling these stories to people years later in other parts of the world hearing similar tales and wondering just what they could be. Somehow we don't seem that much closer to knowing. I would conjecture, though, that as is the case with plant and insect life here, we certainly haven't got all the facts in yet. Perhaps these creatures share the world we live in, but differently, and we have learned to ignore them or pretend they don't exist. Maybe they are trying to tell us they do exist. Perhaps like us, there are those with good intentions and those with not so good intentions. It's my opinion that we are getting closer to the truth every day. A side note here, I read a book a year ago called Initiation by Elizabeth Heitch in which she distinctly mentions the shadow people and the effects they caused on the lives of people she knew, including her own son, before World War II. If this is true, then perhaps these are beings who've been with us for a very long time. Then again, if they are time travelers, all things are possible. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.